Okay, I'll start us off then. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you're very welcome to Engineers Ireland. My name is Roy O'Connor. I chair the Roads and Transportation Society here. So we're delighted to be uh, hosting this active travel series that's been developed by the National Transport Authority. And today's opening presentation is going to be on the basics of cycle design. So we're delighted to have Anne Graham, the Chief Executive from the National Transport Authority here to open the series and say a few words just to get us started. So Anne, good to see you. How are Thanks you? very much, Roy, and delighted to be here with you and with your attendees. So I just want to thank everyone for attending this, this afternoon. Um, this is an exciting time for all those that have been promoting walking and cycling as a mode of choice uh, for years. Whilst the NTA has been in a position to fund some great schemes in our cities um, in the last few years, it has not been at the scale that uh, matched our ambition. But the government has now committed to spending 1.8 billion on walking and cycling in the next five years. That's across the country. And that's a very ambitious uh, spending plan for active travel uh, projects. I know that the NTA and our sister agency TII, as well as our colleagues in local authorities across the country, are committed to, to meet these amb ambitious targets uh, by delivering high quality, safe infrastructure. So I would like to thank Engineers Ireland for hosting these sessions in partnership with the NTA. And I would like to thank my work colleagues, uh, Michael, Oliver, Fanola, and all the transport development team who have put this program together and to thank all the speakers in, in advance. So the session is uh, 12 sessions are planned with the first six uh, running weekly um, until the 1st of July. And the next six will commence at the same time from September the 2nd uh, up to the 8th of October. And the topics that are being covered um, are the basics of cycle design today, pop-up infrastructure, effective communication approaches for sustainable travel schemes, scheme development through options assessment process, bus connects junctions, designing for sustainable modes, and then statutory processes for active travel schemes. So they're the first six sessions. So for the, um, if we're looking at the design of, of schemes, I suppose quality is, is the key here. And um, there's no point in us wasting money putting in small sections of cycle track if they're not forming part of a future network that will encourage new cyclists, or if they result in, in putting pedestrians and cyclists in unsafe locations. So the investment has to be meaningful and appropriate uh, for the location. And in order to assist our colleagues in local authorities and consulting engineering firms, we have put together this series of webinars focusing on the design and provision of cycling infrastructure in association with, with Engineers Ireland. So I hope you enjoy the series and more importantly, feel confident in bringing forward designs of new and improved cycling infrastructure. Um, I hope that we can all work together to get this important programme of work delivered so that we can see more people of all ages walking and cycling safely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, everyone, I'm just going to run through a couple of housekeeping issues before I introduce Michael and Oliver to you. Um, I think we have a couple of slides there as well. Elva's in tech support there with Lovna to help us out through this presentation. Um, just in relation to our um, management of the event, look, as Anne said, we're, we're six weeks in a row now up until the 1st of July, including then uh, 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. So we're going to do our very best to keep to that time, which means me speaking less. Uh, but quickly, if you've any technical issues, please put them in the chat button there and uh, Lovna and Elva will help you sort out any of those. And then uh, any questions you may have, please put them in the Q&A tab on your Zoom um, in your Zoom program there. Just to manage your expectations around uh, the questions and answers at the end, we've quite a lot of people registered uh, and attending here at the moment. So uh, it, it's an introduction to the basics of design for the cycling. Um, in that regard, we do hope that there'll be a more detailed session later on in the autumn. Um, please put in your questions. We, we probably won't get to all of them, but they'll certainly inform a potential second series on, um, on delivering the, the, the basics for cycling design. But also, uh, we're hoping to deliver a more detailed training course that will be in um, conjunction with the imminent release of the upgraded or updated rather a national cycle manual later this year so in that regard um please keep your questions coming in and there's a few of the contact details for you um so today's presentation it's um being brought to you by michael ahern and oliver dalton both from the national transport authority uh this first series is the basics of cycling design 
it's going to be about 40, 45 minutes or so. I'll give the guys a little prompt as we're coming to the end before we can take a few questions. Michael heads up the Transport Development uh, Department in the National Transport Authority. Um, he is part of the original team of transport uh, specialists forming the Dublin Transportation Office back in 1996. So he's got quite a, a career and experience in developing both the National Cycling Manual and the Delivery of the Sustainable Transport Measures Grant, uh, which he oversees. That's a combined allocation of around 300 million euros per year. Uh, his colleague there, Oliver Dalton, is the Senior Program Manager uh, dealing with the administration of the um, Sustainable Travel uh, Transport Management Grants uh, on an annual basis, working with various local authorities. So um, another couple of decades of experience around delivering sustainable transport. So guys, uh, great to see you uh, again. Uh, welcome along to our, our platform here at Engineers Ireland. I'll, I'll hand it over to yourself, Michael, if you'd like to start sharing your screen there and I'll just confirm that we can hear you and we'll, um, we'll go through this. I'll give you a, a couple of minutes prompt as we're coming towards the end of the 45 minutes or so, and then we'll move into a short Q&A. So how are you, Michael? Hi. Good, Good thanks, Sol. Uh, is that okay, Roy? Can you see that? I can see in here. Yep. Yeah. Oh, great. Go. Okay. Well, friends and colleagues, great to be here. Uh, it, it's it's a fantastic series to have. I think it's long overdue, um, and a, a great opportunity for us to exchange. I'm quite confident that there's plenty of people in this um, uh, session who'll know more than I know about many things. But the the, the whole point is that um, with these talks and and the ones following. Uh, that, that we all learn and that we all get a chance to um, explore uh, and, and up our game, I suppose, to a certain degree, but also that we fully understand the, the privilege and, and the challenge of delivering sustainable transport. It's certainly for me, uh, it's been my uh, career really for quite, quite a long time. It isn't easy uh, because we're dealing with uh, people's ambitions and desires and the places that they live and the things that they do. So uh, that, 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 that in itself presents um, many challenges. And, and I think at times we have to be, and we need uh, many disciplines uh, to come together uh, to present um, a, a city that people want to live in, which is what we're all about in the end. Um, so I'm, I move very quickly through this. Uh, the session is I'm going to cover three things, uh, the principles of sustainable safety, quality of service and some golden rules that we, we've kind of figured out over the years. And Oliver is going to follow up. Oliver uh, did a, a great scheme up in Tallinn. And uh, so we're going to talk about some of the, the issues as they manifest themselves in that project. Um, okay, so going through the principles. Well, first of all, to say, and you're, you're probably all aware of this, that cycling is now a key transport mode. Certainly when we started out, it was a leap of faith that, you know, if you put something in for cyclists, would they actually show up? Uh, that, that's all quite changed. And uh, cycling as a key mode for short trips, uh, you know, maybe up to 6K, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's the preferred mode. and it, it's, it's the smart mode for many trips around the city. Um, and, and people have embraced it in their, in their thousands, which is great. Um, this, this is, I, some of you will know I have seven kids and this is, cycling is all about freedom. So for the kids, it's freedom to, to get away from their mobile phones or whatever, or it's freedom that they've independent movement, that they can go up to the Gaelic club or the, the hockey club or the wh whatever they're going to or their school uh, by themselves which is great, so it gives them that independence. But it's also great, it's also great for me and, 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 and my wife that we don't have to drop them. And this is, this is where cycling comes into its own by virtue of the fact that they're going up, it's less cars on the road because we're not on the road. And not only that, we, it gives us freedom. It gives us back time uh, that many people are caught with in terms of car trips that in fact are frankly better done uh, for everyone's sake. Uh, by, uh, by the bicycle. So um, yeah, there's the seven kids. If we manage to create a road system that's suitable for that one on the right-hand side, we'll have done a fantastic job. Um, they, these are younger pictures, uh, but they, they haven't changed really that much. So that, that's our challenge. Um, so yeah, it's a big program. It's 1.8 billion over five years. Uh, it, 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 it is fantastic that government policy um, 
affords us this opportunity now. But, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, we may find as we go down from government policy to regional, to local, to street level, that the buy-in or the understanding uh, of that policy perhaps uh, dissipates a little bit. So um, we've got to work through networks, we've got to work through um, schemes, and we've also got to deliver um, professionals who can, who, can, who can make the difference. And that's what these sessions are about. But as, as Roy said earlier on, we'll have, uh, we are updating the cycle manual. Cycle manual came out in 2011 when frankly we had very few schemes on the ground and many of the, the pictures and images of it were three dimensional rendered images, high quality, so people could have some feel for what good quality would look like, even if we couldn't, couldn't point to too many schemes on the ground. The, the purpose now is to bring far more people into that understanding to also to embrace some of the lessons that we've learned from uh, the cycle manual and from delivery and changes that people want and additional information that people want. And uh, so we're working on the uh, revised cycle manual at the moment, and that will be ready in the autumn time. And what we're looking for at that stage is to bring a whole heap of people in on professional training uh, on the cycle manual. Uh, so that we have uh, really good schemes on the ground afterwards. Okay, so here are the principles of sustainable safety. The reason I chose to cover these today, because we could have covered a vast amount of, uh, of, of issues, is I always got the impression that perhaps this element of the cycle manual was skipped over. Now, a, a, a lot of people on this call, not everyone, uh, are engineers. And engineers, we like to, we like to work from first principles. Uh, particularly when we know that a, a particular code or a particular standard doesn't necessarily fit the circumstances that we're in. So these are five principles that were developed um, in, uh, as part of highway design uh, in a vision zero situation in the, uh, in the I think it was Sweden or, or the Netherlands. When I heard them, it, it, it clarified everything for me about how do we know anything is safe? And of course, it is our duty uh, to make sure it's that, that everything is safe or as safe as it can be. And that means that our designs and the things that we put in the ground, that we take professional responsibility for the fact that we're not contributing with that design to poor outcomes, to people getting hurt or killed. And um, it's for any, any of you who have been there, this, this was the, the Christmas road safety uh, presentation that, that, that was given and it's an annual uh, an event when you hear the, 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 the testimonies of people who are injured, such as that lady there on the, the right hand side sitting down, um, she's a doctor who can't practice anymore uh, by virtue of injuries she sustained in a road accident. And the lady across the way on the wheelchair, again, you know, these, these are their, their life altering uh, injuries and we don't want to be there. So, you know, if that's our professional ambition to make sure that things are sustainably safe, uh, well, how do we do it? So there's five principles. Um, for me, these were a game changer. And I'm going to cover each of them shortly. It was pointed out to me recently that, that the people who uh, came up with these principles have moved on, uh, that these principles were valid until the end of last year and that they've, they've moved on to new ones. Uh, the principles are still principles. They don't change. That's what principles are. Um, but the, the, the people who are, are, are working on, I suppose, more a system-based approach, so they've, they've, they've developed up their, their, their principles to include for, for system approach uh, in terms of responsibilities and the like. But I think it's, it's fair to cover these principles because they're, they're still absolutely valid and will feature in the revised manual. So what are they? Uh, the, there's the five names there, functionality, homogeneity, legibility, forgiveness and self-awareness. Let's cover them one by one if we can. Uh, the first one, the first principle is functionality. And it says what's on the top line there, the, the design that's fit for purpose is safer. So it's like trying to open a, 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 a can of fruit or a can of food with a, a, with a pen knife or a screwdriver. You're going to hurt yourself. Make sure that you're, you're, you're using the right tools for the right job. In the same way, we need to make sure that our streets are laid out for the purposes that we intend those streets to have. So 
Um, now, just to say, by the way, this presentation and all the uh, most times I don't have too many words on my slides. These ones do have a few, um, but you, we will be present. We will be circulating this presentation afterwards, so you don't have to worry about all the words that are in the slides. Uh, you can look at them at your leisure afterwards. But the point being, we need to be very clear in our streets what the purpose of the streets are, and it's not all about transport. These are also the places where people live. And we need, need to understand what people do there now. When I was growing up, I played football in our street. That's not possible anymore. And football generally isn't one of these functions anymore. Um, but what's going on there? What, what changes will happen on the street by virtue of what we're doing? And is there public support for it? So the scheme on the right-hand side is one that Dublin City are proposing at the moment, which is uh, pedestrianization of, of South William Street, part of it, and traffic management changes uh, to, to support that. And that's out for public consultation. And that's what comes back. What comes back is what people like about it, what they don't like about it, as it impacts on their lives. Okay, so what are the transport functions? So it's not all about cycling. So when we want to introduce cycling, we have to be cognizant of all the other transport functions that are there. And perhaps some of them will be precluded by our design and, uh, or maybe we need to retain them and we have to embrace them. And therefore that informs the design. And just a list along there, but some of the ones that, that, that actually came up on schemes I was talking about with my, my colleagues, refuse collection. If you call this a, a, a road, can the refuse truck get down? It's really important. Um, bus stops, that's that's one that we need to obviously make, uh, have, have attention to. The scheme here on the right-hand side, this is um, uh, an Arctic delivering into uh, super value in Black Rock. So the Black Rock scheme is a very attractive scheme. It's changed the, the nature of the village uh, and very much far more placemaking involved. But the Arctic truck still had to get in there. Um, so, and, and it can manage. Um, but it's, it's just to be aware that when we're going in, it's not cycling and nothing else. It's cycling in a context. That's the transport context. And here's the, here's the, the living, uh, if you like, uh, you know, functions that go on in the street. And there's a whole list of them there on the side. Uh, what's interesting is that, that this is becoming a far more topical issue now. What people want their streets to, to be and to do. And clearly, if you're playing chess like they are on that screen, that that's um, College Green. It was it was you know they had cl temporary closures. Chess is fine so long as the businesses can get their loading in at some other time, and all that has to be worked out and to get the balance between the the living and the the the, the place functions versus the transport functions, and that's our challenge. And if it was dead easy, this course would be very short. Um, but it isn't. It's what we, we're, we've this privilege of reshaping our cities uh, for how people want to live. OK, uh, here's a simple example. It's a scheme that was done uh, and it looks straightforward enough, you know, put down bollards and mark out a, a temporary cycle scheme. And it is temporary, uh, which is fine. But by virtue of that alone, it's impossible to park there anymore. But there's other issues that you look at, even just from this little photograph, well, this, it looks like there's people walk along here, but there's no provision for walking. And should that have been included in the scheme? Is there bus parking? Is there, there's a, the, even simple schemes require us to go through the list of the, all the functions and the things that people do and then figure out, is, the, is this the right design? Uh, and far better to do this before we build it, because what you don't want is to build it and then find we didn't think about a particular problem with a particular road user and, and we ended up with big problems. OK, um, and the other thing I might just say about functionality, if I may, is that it has to work when it's needed. So this scheme on the right, and this is from my hometown in Bray, perfectly fine footpath, there's no parking, whatever else it is, but there's four schools. And this was, I took the photograph because I was trying to get down the footpath and everyone was coming up because I was late collecting my child. And I hadn't a hope. It took me about six minutes to get down that footpath because there was no room and the parking had come in and people were picking up and the whole lot. So the footpath needs to be about double the size that it is for the number of uh, school kids in that area. And the same down here for people who are familiar with Westland Row Railway Station. In the peak of the peak, you know, the cycle facility 
is compromised, but so is the footpath by virtue of the number of people going down. So it's really important to understand how it works when it's needed. Um, and for that reason, in the new manual, we'll be changing from peak hour traffic flows and in fact, peak hour everything flows, as, sorry, from average flows, double ADT, uh, to peak hours, because peak hours when it counts. Okay, uh, homogeneity is the second one. So the idea is that you don't mix fast with slow, turning with straight, big with small. And if you do that, if you don't mix those, things are safer. That's the principle of hom homogeneity. This slide here at the bottom is the opening of the Dublin Port Tunnel. And I had the privilege of being there. This remains the single best piece of cycle infrastructure we ever built. Because by pushing this tunnel in, the trucks were able to come out of the city. And by virtue of that, we were able to reshape the city. That was back in 2006. And Arctic trucks and bicycles simply don't mix. There's a bigger discussion that we probably need to have around Arctics in, in city centres and town centres. But, but that, that is part of the story. And I suppose it points to the fact that when we do network planning, we want to know where all the modes are going in order to understand where the bicycles will be and who they're, who they're, who, who's left there. Um, so homogeneity, this is great. This is the N4 and highway design for all of you that are, that are involved in road design. It's absolutely fine. You know, we merge on, we merge off. We make sure that speeds are, are matched up so that people can get, take their gaps and, and the whole lot. And the worst that can happen is side swipe. You know, that someone changes a lane and they, they'll, they'll bump against another car going in the same direction. Uh, and hopefully we won't have, you know, serious injuries or serious accident from it. That's the nature of, if you like, how we do highway design and DMRB standards that we've built. And we've built fantastic uh, motorways and trunk roads across the, the country using really good standards. But those standards are based on vehicles of a particular capacity and drivers of a particular competence using these roads, particularly motorways. That changes when we get to town centres and, and town environments, because it's multimodal, it's pedestrians, it's cyclists, it's, um, well, maybe e-scooters, who knows? Um, a whole bunch of people, buses, deliveries, that we don't have to worry about or we don't design for when we're designing main roads because it's, it's, not, it's not relevant. Um, so it becomes a different, um, it becomes a different challenge so we do want to do this. We do want to reduce the speed, mass and direction of the modes. And so there's a big push, a very welcome push over recent years to reduce speeds inside in urban areas because it does make things safer. And that if something nasty happens, the outcome will be better. So it's, a, it's fundamental. And um, yes, it does mean if you're driving by car, uh, it might marginally change your, your journey time. Frankly, with the number of traffic lights we have, and you know, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of difference, but it certainly makes a massive difference to safety outcomes. So very easy, I think, to you know, to, to sort out mass and to sort out speed. It's a bigger challenge to sort out direction. Pedestrians in particular can stand, they can turn, they can cross, they can do what they like, and bicycles to a degree as well. And so changing in direction is a key issue. I can't cover it here. We'll cover it in a separate topic because it obviously relates to left-hand turns, right-hand turns, pedestrians crossing across cyclists and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but just to say to be aware of it, uh, because you can still get, you know, a, a cyclist co collision with a pedestrian can still have um, poor outcomes. So legibility is the third one. So we've covered functionality and we've covered homogeneity. The third one is legibility. And that means that a road environment that all users can read and understand is safer. Both of these uh, schemes here are entirely legible. The one on top is a recent scheme that went in in Galway. It's a school street. So, so hey, it's a school street. There's no vehicles or there's, you know, it's, it's, there may be an access required or that, that's about it. But otherwise, it's very clear. It's, a, it's, it's, for, it's for kids and parents going to the school and it's, it's not for vehicles. The one at the bottom is also very clear. It's a motorway. 
and and you know motorways um who's allowed to have a sign there somewhere you know there's no l drivers there's nothing under 50 uh, 50 cc and everyone understands the rules so very very legible and those roads are safer okay so we have to check how legible our our our, our design is and there's a list here on the side and again you can check this afterwards on the pdf but very clearly very very, very quickly the conflicts should be obvious. You should be able to see what, what to expect. The resolution of that conflict should be obvious as well. Something as simple as on a roundabout, you yield to traffic coming from your right-hand side. That's fine, everyone understands that, but there's others that are less obvious. And is it clear to us how these things get resolved? Some drivers think that by virtue of turning, putting their indicator on and turning left, that, that they're entitled, that they've, they've priority over anyone else. Might is right. That's their understanding. It's it's not necessarily so, but so it's not mutually understood how the conflict gets resolved between the turning car and and a pedestrian who's crossing in the mouth of the junction. Do all road users know where to position themselves? Are they aware of what other people might do? Do they know in advance what to expect? The, approaching a junction, or approaching a bend, or whatever else it is. Critically, can they communicate visually with each other? We communicate so much with our eyes and by being able to see someone else. I don't know how it works, frankly, it's, it's, it's the area of, of psychology, but it's amazing when you can see someone, you can sort an awful lot out between you and that person just by being able to see them. Um, so that, that's our checklist. That scheme on the right-hand side, these two are very close to each other. They happen to be in my hometown. Clearly this one, is not a legible junction. The one on top uh, is, is a clear, le clear legible situation. This is a pedestrianized scheme in Galway, fits all the bills. Everything is very, very clear, including the, the design of the, these upstanding bollards. But clearly this guy on his bicycle just ignored everything. And you know, that, that's, that, uh, that, that brings us to road user behavior, which is a, a different topic again. Forgiveness is the fourth principle, which means if there's an accident which is designed for the best outcome, another version of it is if you make a mistake, particularly as a vulnerable road user, you don't pay for it with a serious injury. And the, the key elements there, you know, to make something forgiving, get the speeds low, get the turning speeds low, uh, make sure there's room to, av to avoid. If you see something happening that there's escape room, uh, that means soft landings as well, that you don't have, you know, um, guardrails in particular and the yeah, heavy implements on, on your inner side and giving yourself time to stop. That's a forgiving environment in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an urban situation and some examples of it there. This one here is interesting. This one is in Navan and there is guardrail. We funded it and it's in a scheme that's just gone in. The purpose of it, it's interesting, it's, it is at a remove from the traffic lane just in case if a bicycle comes down there is some evasion space but it's there actually because the, the footpath is below road level. By and large, guardrail is to be avoided because there's a risk of entrapment. If someone ends up for whatever reason on the wrong side of the guardrail, they can get caught. So, you know, guardrail was, was derogare 20 years ago. We really, it sh it's really on an exceptional basis that, that guardrail should feature in, in our designs. The last one is this the last principle, which is around self-awareness. And it's the principle that says that the more the users know how to interact with the environment, the safer it is. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. It's a little bit more vague, uh, but the idea here, for instance, is um, this is a cycle route that's put in. It runs along the old N4 or the, the current N4, I should say. Um, the, the Western Road from Galway coming into Dublin and the cycle route pops over here and pops along there and heads in along by the side of the road. And people use it, you know, it's generally people doing longer distances and they've got road bikes and lights and helmets and the whole lot. You don't see eight-year-olds or nine-year-olds out in this and I'm sure parents wouldn't let them out in it because it's that type of environment where, well, you know, you kind of need to have your wits about you because you are crossing over. It's yes, it's safe to do so, but it's you're, you're crossing over um, an off ramp to get onto this thing. You're in a heavily trafficked environment. It's the same with it, perhaps with a motorway. 
with a motorway, there's certain drivers who don't go on the motorway um, or we don't allow them on. But there's a lot of people who elect not to go on motorways. I know elderly people tend to avoid complex junctions. They don't like motorways because they have perhaps more difficulty assessing um, junctions and whatever else. So they pick routes that, that suit their capacity. And that's really what we're talking about here with self-awareness. Interesting here again, so they, this is, you know, with self-awareness, if you look at this parent, she's bringing her kid along. There's a cycle lane along here. This one is in, in South Dublin, but yet she che chooses to bring her child on the footpath um, because she's aware of the child. And she's not entirely convinced that the child will interact with perhaps, I don't know, I didn't ask her, but this is what she's doing. She's cycling along the footpath. And again, we might ask ourselves inside in somewhere like Georgia Street, um, who do we expect down there, you know, uh, and who will choose to be there? And that might inform to a degree uh, the design of our network. It would be ideal that this would be a far superior scheme, far wider than, than what's there. But we can ask ourselves, as we, again, who's likely to use it? If this person, for instance, if, you, if, you, if any of you have ever had uh, one of these specialized cargo bikes or, or, or whatever, you know you have to plan your journey because there's certain places where it's very difficult to cycle with these things, particularly if you want to cycle off-road. So we have a journey planner that helps with this. But what I'm trying to get across with this fifth principle is that part of our design of the network is understanding, helping people to choose, giving them good information and, and providing a, probably at a network level the right level of access for everyone around the city, um, but understanding that people will, will opt to choose different routes. Okay, um, is everyone okay so far? We, we, we carry on to quality of service. Okay, quality of service I think is, is the other one that perhaps people skipped over. It's really important and Anne mentioned it at the start. To get the right quality of service. Okay, so we're in a market, we're in the transport market. Uh, and in fact, many people who cycle possibly could walk the same journey, possibly would like to, uh, and do choose to take the bus for longer, for, for longer trips. Uh, and they obviously use their car. And we want to attract people uh, to use the bicycle as the smart mode for particular trips. So if we're in a market, if we're in this transport market, then market rules apply. So the first, first rule in a market is don't expect a, a, a huge take up from a lousy product. So if you're putting in something that's really not particularly attractive, why would anyone use it? Um, particularly if they already have a car. So we can't change the weather, but if we give them, you know, with the exception of that, if we give them just a really attractive offer, very stress-free, to a breast that they can chat to someone going along or they can overtake it, someone who's perhaps, you know, if they want to make, make progress and pass people out and if the surface is smooth and all that. So we want, if we can do that, albeit that we can't change the weather, we can make the trip very attractive. And that's part of our job. It should be an attractive uh, thing to do, to do cycling. The second bit is, is the corollary of that, which is, there's no point in putting in extravagant schemes in a situation where you're never going to have a huge take up because the trips aren't there. So if you're in a small village or if you're in, a, a, you know, a, a place where, and in particular, you know, we, cycling and hills, the more the hills come into play, the cycling numbers universally across the world, they drop off. And I suppose that brings us to the point of understanding where your trips are going to come from so that you know what you're designing for, you know your potential market. There's a lot of people who will cycle and would like to cycle short distances, but they can't by virtue of the, the offer that's, that's presented to them. But then there's some places where there just is no demand for cycling. So very hilly situations, the cycling numbers drop off. And I know there's a discussion going on about e-bikes and whatever. Let's see how that pans out. But, but just for, for, for where we are right now, hills have a massive impact on gradient. And so does the scale of a town. A very small town will not generate huge numbers of cycling, simply because there's not a huge number of trips in the first place. And the third point is probably a, a, an important one as well. 
the idea that we're pushing in cycling and we can only fit in so much and we end up with a, in a substandard cycle facility, but we also end up making everything else substandard as well. Substandard footpaths, substandard cycle, par, or the, the car, car, car journeys are loading or whatever else. All we're doing is annoying everyone. So it's really important that we generate win-win situations. And, and that means we're engaging with people about the street that they live on and what they want to do uh, with, with their streets. Um, let me just see how we are time. Roy, Roy how are we time-wise? Uh, 25 to 1, so we've all of our and maybe a couple of questions. OK, there. so I, I'll see if we can speed through the rest of this. So there's, we've made it real easy to figure out what the quality of service is like. And there's various different people around the world had, you know, one of them had 36 separate factors you had to measure before you could figure out whether something was a high quality of service or not. Ours are very easy and there's five of them. It's what's the surface like? What's the cycling regime like? How often do you get interrupted as you're trying to make progress, whether it's bins or people crossing you or you have to stop at driveways or whatever else it is. The journey time delay at signals as a percentage of your overall trip. And that's a really important one as well, because anyway, they're, they're all important. And the last one is how much traffic is in your face. In the first manual, we didn't describe this particularly well. We wanted something handy, so we just used percentage HGVs. But what we really wanted to get across was how much the traffic is in your face when you're making the journey, because frankly, it's, it's not, the more traffic is in your face, the less attractive the facility is. So let's cover a few examples. This one here, this is up in Mount Marion. This, this actually is, is top quality in terms of cycling, believe it or not. Good, good surface, perfect surface, including drainage. Yes, you can cycle two abreast interruptions along the route there's none you reduce the late signals there's none there's no signals on along this route anyway and the impact of traffic how much traffic is in your face there is none and the reason we can say that with confidence is because of this Dunleary rat down put in this gate that's bicycle only at the end of the road many many years ago and as a result that intervention meant that they didn't have to change the, the road, they just had to change the nature of the, the, it's a filtered permeability or modal filters is the new name for the same thing that allows pedestrians and cyclists through and the rest don't come through. This approach is really important. And there's many, if you, if you go on Google Earth and, and I, I would encourage you to do so, to just toddle around to Denmark or Holland, to some of the medium sized towns and villages, you'll see that the cycling facilities really on one or two main roads through the town. And otherwise, it's, it's, it's a calmed environment is what they do uh, to, to, to give the cyclists what they need. And th some examples there, this is one from Holland, uh, this is one from Denmark, they, grew a tree in the middle of the road and this is obviously it's one way there's a very nice scheme just gone in in Bray it's a shuttle system uh, on the seafront but this is one way of doing it so just remember what you're trying to get what you're trying to offer cyclists good good surface can you cycle to abreast how much are you interrupt as you move along what are the signals and what's the the impact of traffic this one is Frascati Road it ticks four to five boxes really well. Fantastic surface. Yes, you can cycle to abreast. No, there's not a whole lot of interruptions. You're not particularly delayed at, at, at junctions. However, it's a busy road. There is traffic on this road. And as a result, there's nothing we can do about it, but it does mean that particularly in the peak times, it's, it, it reduces the, 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 the experience, if you like. Uh, of the road and it does therefore bring down the, 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 the attractiveness of the route somewhat. Here's a third example and again once you start asking yourself these five questions what's the, what's the surface and drainage like well this particular one not particularly good I don't know where this is by the way so apologies to whoever is involved in it. Um, can you cycle to abreast? No you can't but that, that's probably okay because you're coming up into some sort of a mixed area. Uh, are you interrupted along it? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, reduced delay signals you're coming into a junction area and the traffic is, looks like it's right beside you so again it's not a particularly high quality of service um, this one here is is Ashburn and County Meath and again if you rattle through them the issue here is that you will have it's it, there's Ashburn's bypass but there's still a significant amount of traffic goes through the town so again 
high quality, but the traffic element reduces the experience. But, but you know, it's a top class scheme. Um, so how do you do it? What you have to watch out for is that with the, the five factors, the lowest one determines the overall score. So I'll give you an example that down there at the bottom. You can see you can have great surface, great, you know, very few conflicts, delayed junction, and the traffic is, there's not that much traffic. But because someone decided in this fictional notional scheme I'm talking about that it was single file cycling, it absolutely pulls it down and you get a B score. And just to explain, B is actually just okay, frankly. It's, it's, it's the D is the worst. So it's, um, and so you have to ask yourself, have you got the cycling regime right? This is the, probably the number one issue you need to think about. Cycling to a breast should be the norm. If we build footpaths, that the footpaths that you had to walk single file, well, who would walk? You couldn't talk to anyone, you couldn't pass anyone without stepping out onto the road. So as a result, over the last 15 or 20 years, footpaths are now 1.8 meter standard, great. What we need to get across in our cycle design is that it's, we should not be going for the minimum. The generally you should be looking for two abreast. If that means one and one overtaking, fine, but that should be the norm and the minimum. There are cases where we would drop down to single file. And where are they? Low density areas where you're not going to get a whole load of cyclists. You know, low density, that means, and low trip forecast as well. Again, where you're just providing a minimum provision and you're, it's not for a whole heap of cyclists. Pinch points, we can live with pinch points and single file at pinch points until we get a better solution if that's the approach we're taking. Uh, some places we, we absolutely need to get cyclists down to single file because we're approaching a hazard and we need people to, to take slow speeds and whatever. Uh, temporary schemes, again, we can live with, with, with narrower facilities, but it really should not be our ambition in the long term. And again, with roadworks, uh, again, single file is probably okay. But otherwise, I wouldn't be rushing to the exceptions if we can get into our heads that two abreast is where that's when the cycling, the way you get to relax, you get to talk, you get to have space, you get to feel comfortable. That should be the norm. Um, so, and then if I may, I'll just run through these very quickly. These are kind of golden rules that have come up over the years. They're not quite rules, but, but look, if, it's, if it looks wrong, it is wrong. Uh, we could probably say that that's the vast majority of schemes. If it looks wrong, there's something wrong. It means it fails on legibility. And in particular, one of the things I would suggest is there's a thing called the six way check in the cycle manual. You know, it may look fine on paper, but have you figured out how does the cyclist go straight ahead when traffic's moving? Sometimes things are designed, they're okay. If traffic stops and someone gets up to the start, that's fine, but it actually doesn't work when traffic's moving. There's this thing called six way check. Check it out. This one on the right is obviously, this has been around for years. Uh, eventually it'll get sorted out, but the cycle track literally comes to a dead end. You know, it's clearly wrong. Just to say as well, if a scheme looks right, it may be right, but it may not as well. And sometimes things that look okay on paper don't actually work out in, in practice. So th there's a whole lot of checks we need to do. This is the second golden rule. Don't expect others to do things that you wouldn't do yourself. No one is going to get off their bicycle here. It just isn't going to happen. So whoever designed that, you know, it's just an unrealistic design. So, and for that, because we're dealing with multimodality, you need to put yourself in everyone's situation. What's this like? What's my design like as a cyclist, as a pedestrian, as a parent pushing a buggy, perhaps as someone pushing someone in a wheelchair? Uh, what's it like if you're blind? What's it like as a driver? If you're trying to load in this place, how does it work? So you really have to engage and understand each of the modes. That's what, what makes this, this, this gig such an attractive one. You have to use your imagination all the time. Third golden rule, two-way on one side is generally not, it, it's, it's, it's not as good as one way on two sides. A lot of people like two-way on one side because it appears to reduce the amount of space you need to make provision for the bike. And this is true to a certain extent. However, there are, there are serious issues with two-way cycling on one side, particularly when there's nothing on the other side of the road. 
One of them is when you're crossing side roads and driveways, the driver generally doesn't expect the cyclist that's coming the wrong way. Okay, and that is an issue and it's happened, it's happened in, in Dublin. The second one is the cyclist has to get across the road to get to this and then go back. He or she may decide that's too much bother and then they'll end up in the traffic regime that you didn't intend them to be in the first place. You put the cycle track in to protect them, but then if they don't use it, then you've actually made a, a, a poor situation worse because the drivers won't be expecting the cyclists in the remaining parts of the road. And then the last one is with two-way cycling, there is a risk, depending on where you are, of bike-bike conflicts. Bicycles overtaking other bicycles and hitting cyclists coming the other way or whatever else. Okay, the next one is really important. And I mentioned it earlier on, eye-to-eye -eye contact allows humans to consider each other. It generally, you, you, you won't, you, you know, you won't hit someone if you can see them and particularly if you can see their eyes. This is something to watch out for two lane entry, the guy at the back cannot see the bicycle. The front guy might be able to see the bicycle coming along. But if, if this is my daughter cycling along here, this second person, this may, guy may stop, but this guy may hit her. So this two lane entry, and particularly at an oblique angle, is not appropriate to cycle facilities. This is something that's just tightening up junctions and we've issued allocations to local authorities this year to go and tighten up junctions. Perpendicular junctions are much safer. Um, it slows down the turning speeds and it, it gives much better uh, eye vision between the users. And there's just some examples. This space here approaching the junction where people can establish themselves and see each other is also really important. Okay, another quick one is if you're going to replace the road, if you're going to resurface or you're going to reline or whatever else, just reconsider it first. Uh, th these two schemes were done, frankly, I don't know if there's any infrastructure on this other than the lining, the, but the, the car parking was put outside and it meant that we have a brand new and really attractive Contraflow cycle facility here. Uh, this is in, in Albert Street in Cork. This one is Randall in Dublin. And by virtue of reducing the traffic lanes by, I think it was about 250 millimetres, it, it gave sufficient width to this cycle lane that it's become really attractive for outbound cyclists. They can pass each other and it's far more comfortable. So these two guys, I was cycling home and these two guys just had a conversation the whole way up to, to Rathgar. So width is really important and you don't generally need anything more than three meters inside in, in uh, low speed urban areas. There may be one or two exceptions, but three meters really should be the norm for, uh, for your average uh, traffic lane. Uh, I, I might skip over these because Oliver, you need to get in, but just to have a look at this afterwards. One way systems, there may be good ideas, but there's, there's seven things to think about when you put in a one way system. Um, so they're not necessarily a panacea. And traffic signals, let me cover this one if I may. It's a big change in traffic signals. Previously, and when we were all inside in college, we had this book called Webster and Cobb, it was developed in 1966. And the whole idea was that traffic signals were there to maximize vehicular capacity and minimize driver de delay. And they have concepts in there such as lost time and, and optimizing cycle time, all for the benefit of the car driver. And the philosophy included that you pop in a provision for cycle ped or pedestrians at some stage when you're working out this wonderfully efficient vehicular capacity. It still has a place. There's the Dunkettle interchange. And boy, do we need those signals to be as efficient as they can possibly be for our highway network. And they are, they're just so fine tuned. But that's not what we need when we get into urban areas. And there, we have a vast number of people moving through junctions in different modes. Um, and so the challenge is entirely different. And so I would propose that the, the purpose of traffic signals is safe regulation, absolutely, that we don't, we don't mix the wrong conflicts with each other. The second bit is that essentially the traffic signals are to deliver transport policy at that point. So if the transport policy on a particular corridor is bus priority, well, we would expect that reflected in the signals. If it's about provision for bicycles, we would expect that. So it's, it's no longer the game of just you know, managing or maximizing vehicles. 
it's an int and we need to be clear that the traffic policy is reflected in the signals. So the game for traffic signals has changed. Um, and it's, we need to work on that because a lot of our signals and a lot of the anal analysis tools we have for signals are all built around uh, how does it work for the car? But that's no longer the question. It's how does it work for our multimodal, uh, multifaceted uh, urban traffic and road uh, situation? Okay, I'm going to hand over to Oliver, and I'm sorry if I if I if I was boring or if I went uh, uh, went over my time. Could you stop sharing, Michael? And I'm just going to uh, Elva. You might do that for me, please. Thanks. Okay, I'll just get the slides up. So. You might let me know when you can see that, if that's okay. Oh, there now, Oliver, and we can hear you. So you're all good. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, one of the things that Michael and myself discussed earlier is, is how to capture uh, the basics of cycle design in uh, in 20 minutes or so. And so, I, this is a this is a case study of uh, a project that was delivered by South Dublin County Council. Uh, and designed by CSEA back in 2016, and it captures a lot of the uh, items which Michael has already gone through. So just to give some context in terms of where this project originally uh, uh, came from, it was part of the Greater Dublin Area Cycle Network Plan, which is, which is available to download from the NTA website. It fits within slide number six here, or, or window number six within the network. And you can see from this particular uh, sketch, the red lines indicate the primary routes uh, into the city centre and the blue routes are the secondary routes. A green route, green colour is the, the, the greenway. So it's a comprehensive network of, of, the, of the GDA in its entirety. Um, just zooming in on the particular project itself, um, you can see in that window where it is located. And one of the things I wanted to, cap wanted, wanted to talk to you today about is, the, is the, the various types of link design that are relevant to this particular section. If I can just zoom in here, just to give you some context of where this is, this is the Green Hills Road heading up into Crumlin and, and, and into the city centre, which now forms part of one of the Bus Connects routes. Uh, the, the section we're looking at today is this line along here, Route 9A. And the first part of it is your traditional uh, raised shelf cycle track design, but there's a very bespoke kind of approach from what's known as the Greenhills, or sorry, the Bancroft roundabout into the M50 located at this point, where we have a, a section of mixed or shared street. And um, the traffic function of this particular link is, is different to the traffic function of this particular link here. Um, there is an underpass beneath the M50, which allows this particular, uh, this particular link to, to apply a different type of uh, cycle design uh, in, in this area. It's a cul-de-sac for traffic, for general traffic. It's just serving the residential communities in this corner and in this particular corner. And one of the things that uh, I wanted to capture today is, is that it may seem that this is a very Dublin-centric um, uh, uh, project, but I suppose the N81 bypass, which I'm right, reliably informed was upgraded to dual carriageway in the, in the early 1980s, actually uh, allowed the, uh, the, the Tala Main Street or Tala Village, as it's, uh, as it's known, to uh, it, 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 it enabled this particular project to, to proceed at that particular time. And that yeah. is probably... Um, um, in the context of uh, there's many uh, local authorities here that are, are trying to deal with cycle provision in rural towns and, uh, and, and large urban towns outside the GDA. This is a very representative uh, situation of what can be achieved in those towns. Moving on then just to, in relation to some project information. Uh, it, again, as I said, it's part of Route 9A, which is Tala Village to the Spawell Roundabout. And just to give context, uh, Tala has a population of 84,500, which is bigger than some of our regional cities. Uh, it's 1.8 kilometers in length. Um, and as part of the cycle network plan in 2011, uh, there was a baseline study undertaken uh, which projected that 110 cyclists were on the link. And by 2021, it was an expected 200 growth. We did a survey in 2018 of the route, and we were all, already achieving 117% uplift in the numbers. I'll go into that in a bit more detail uh, a, a bit later on. It was planning approved in 2013, and, and, and South Dublin County Council took on that challenge of uh, reallocating road space along this particular, uh, this particular link, which is a very challenging kind of scenario in, in, in urban areas. As Michael touched on, the loss of parking and dealing with all of the other aspects uh, of the multimodality of this particular corridor is a very important characteristic that we need to consider. 
it, it was a 12 month construction time frame, and the scheme was complete in 2016. And just in terms of those of you who are interested in cost, the total scheme budget for this 1.8 kilometers was about 6 million uh, with a construction cost of three and a half million. So that gives you a kind of a, an indication of, uh, and I'll show you some images of the scheme afterwards of uh, the cost per kilometer. Um, then just moving on to the link design, as I mentioned earlier, um, that link design is, 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 is identified in the cycle manual and traditionally it's two, two general traffic lanes or maybe even more general traffic lanes with a 50 millimeter upstand to the cycle facilities and then uh, a further 50 millimeter or, or 75 millimeter up to um, the footpath provision. Uh, that's an image of the scheme in its constructed form and you can see on both sides, these are your two cycle facilities moving down uh, both sides, which are general traffic lane, just to say it is a, it is a very, uh, uh, it, it is a bus route, and it's just, uh, uh, I'll touch on the bus stops a little bit later. Again, going back to the section of the cul-de-sac at Brookmount, um, here it is here, and it, it's absolutely appropriate in this particular environment for cyclists to share along this particular leg that goes down to the cul-de-sac at the M50. Um, again, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's design information within the cycle manual of where, where those are appropriate. And generally speaking, they're in residential areas. There are cul-de-sacs. There's little or no true traffic. This happens to be um, a, a cul-de-sac down to the back of the basketball arena in Tala. But in, in terms of uh, traffic capacity or traffic volumes, it's very, very lowly trafficked. So one of the things that I just wanted to touch on uh, in, in, in this presentation is how we deal with roundabouts. And as, as, as mentioned earlier, um, when we look at roundabouts, we're talking about uh, safety, not capacity. And those of you who are familiar with Arcady, which is a design tool for, for dealing with um, uh, roundabout design capacity in terms of vehicle capacity moving through it, uh, it can often spit out unfavorable answers uh, in terms of the, the, the capacity or, or the effect of general traffic by by changing uh, existing DMRB style roundabouts into the options that are shown down on the, uh, uh, the, the southernmost uh, right-hand corner of it. So the two options available to us when we consider uh, how to improve existing roundabouts is one uh, where the cyclists are sharing with general traffic around the roundabout in the circulating carriageway, or two where they're segregated away from general traffic. And uh, from, 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 from the, uh, the cycle manual, it, it identifies the capacity requirements or the capacity limitations of each one of those options. Um, here's two examples that I, I uh, from my, my travels down uh, around Ireland, which we uh, tend to try and avoid. Um, the, you've got uh, on, on the most left-hand picture, you've got a cycle lane uh, sharing with two lanes of circulating traffic around the carriageway. We try and avoid those because of the safety concerns. It's not about capacity, it's about safety. Um, everybody has to uh, wants to uh, arrive home. And, and the second one on the right-hand side is a similar scenario within Dublin. Um, I, I often refer to this particular slide because I think it's a very, very worthwhile representation of the amount of conflicting movements at a particular roundabout. Now, this is the extreme case. It's the Walkinstown roundabout on the Green Hills Road. And you can see that it, it's a six arm roundabout, but each and every movement there has to be made safely. And in terms of pedestrians and cyclists, it's a very challenging environment in order to uh, navigate this particular, this particular route. Um, and as Michael had in his slides, the approach, um, the approach to the arms and the splayed entry, uh, entry details are all something that, that contribute to that environment that is less than favorable towards cyclists. This is the example that we installed um, on the uh, on, uh, known as the Green Hill, or sorry, known as the Glenview roundabout on this particular scheme. And as you can see uh, from this image, it's an aerial view of the uh, of the scheme. Uh, the traffic regime on this particular one was in the region of uh, 20 to 25,000 AADT circulating around the carriageway. The predominant movement is from this particular arm to this particular arm because the Tala bypass is down on this particular this particular arm, and this is the one way. This is the the link towards the M50 and beneath the M50 through uh, through box culverts. But you can see uh, the approach to the roundabout is uh, a, a segregated type arrangement where cyclists are segregated from general traffic and use the zebra crossings uh, to cross across to to access the various the various aspects. One of the things I wanted to mention about this particular scheme is that. Um, is that it addresses not only the cycle provision and the transport provision, it often, uh, a lot of the schemes we come across uh, address 
urban realm issues, uh, improved footpaths and improved public safety in terms of public lighting, improved drainage and underground utilities. They're all aspects of these particular projects, which we capture as part of the transport function. So that's just the image from the cycle manual of the uh, uh, of this this particular type of roundabout. So just just to give you some context again, um, this is a bef before picture, and thanks to Google for this particular image. You can see the two lane entry into the roundabout. Again, pedestrian and cyclists were were poorly accommodated as part of this particular scheme, and that's what it looks like today if you if you go out there. Some of the key design issues. Again, the two lane entry was reduced to one and. And Arcady was used to, to, to support that particular uh, 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 traffic analysis. Um, it, it had suboptimal facilities for pedestrians and cyclists, but now they are far greater. Um, one of the things that's critical to this particular uh, design is the need for this 50 millimeter ride-on area to manage, uh, hate, that should say, manage uh, the larger vehicles. This is a, 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 a good bus route in, it has the 54A and the 77s that serve Tala. Um, and they have to be able to track around this roundabout in an efficient manner. So one of the things that is key to key to achieving that that uh, turning movement for those larger vehicles is by providing this uh, this this run on run over facility. It allows uh, the larger vehicles to track over it, but the uh, experience is, is that the, the car traffic will just take the blacktop uh, uh, line around the roundabout. And then it also has the Belisha beacons. Uh, on each of the arms to, uh, to for pedestrians and cyclists to navigate. One of the things that was uh, that we went during the construction of this is um, we had 70, we, we originally built it with 100, with 100 mil ramps on approach to these arms, but we found that the underside of buses and various other HGVs were, were badly, were, were affected by that particular. So we dropped down the footpath to 75 mil at these particular occasions. At locations and provided a, a 75 mil ramp on approach. Another aspect of this particular design that we found once in the construction phase that was very important is the ability for one vehicle to just sit beyond the Belisha Beacon crossing. That allowed, uh, uh, it, it prevented the second vehicle and third vehicle stacking across the pedestrian facilities as they were approaching. Once that vehicle moved away, then the next vehicle would take that space and it was a much more uh, streamlined transition. Um, I'm just going to move on very quickly. I don't know how I'm doing time wise, time wise right. Um, some of the key design features uh, along this particular scheme, as I said, it is a, a heavily used bus route. And in terms of the interaction between cyclists and buses and pedestrians, that's a conflict that has to be managed. And it's, it's horses for courses in terms of the appropriate solution. You can see in the image there, those cyclists are sandwiched between that particular bus. And it's about trying to make sure from the principles of sustainable safety that the, 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 the facility being designed captures all of these particular requirements. On the right hand side there, that's, that bus stop is being removed, uh, but essentially it was a suboptimal design where we sent the cyclists around the back so in terms of, sorry, and then this is also from the N11 in Dublin, uh, where pedestrians were stacking on the, uh, the cycle facility. And because, uh, because Michael mentioned earlier, slope or, or gradient is, is, is quite an important characteristic. The downhill slope at this particular location was causing uh, significant um, uh, challenges to the, the various modes. That also has been removed uh, subsequently. So, just very briefly in terms of bus stops, um, there is a number of options available within the, the cycle manual to address uh, the type of bus stops appropriate to the certain certain locations. Um, they're known as island bus stops and there's variants of those particular islands. The first one of uh, you can see here was constructed on the Tala scheme. Um, it, 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 it's predominantly designed in such a fashion so as to manage the conflict between the, the various modes. And I know through the, the, we're working with some of the disability groups at the moment to try and improve on this particular uh, 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 design uh, as part of the, the update to the cycle manual. But essentially it's about managing the, 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 the cyclist and the pedestrian interaction at these locations where the shelter is located on an island. And there's an image of that particular bus stop constructed where the cyclist bypasses around at the back and the pedestrians uh, cross at, at uncontrolled crossing locations. Another option is whereby we have a pedestrian priority zone uh, where the shelter is located to the back. Again, it's appropriate for high, uh, for, um, uh, high bus frequency routes. 
and you can see here uh, the, the scheme being constructed on the Tala scheme. There's the bus stop with the with the pedestrian priority uh, zone across the, the front of it. Again, spaces uh, was, was available on this scheme to implement these particular proposals. There's a bus parked at uh, uh, and passengers uh, alighting from the bus and you can see the, the interaction between the various modes and as, as Michael uh, quite rightly identified earlier, it, uh, eye contact is, is, is essential in order for people to manage the, uh, the, the, the conflict between the various modes at these locations. Uh, finally, one, uh, one other type of bus stop which is in the cycle manual is where we have um, uh, the cyclists on approach which cross across in front of the shelter in a pedestrian priority zone. It's used for, it's, it's, its design objective is where we have a lower frequency of bus services, so where the headway is less than 10 minutes. And that was also constructed on the TALA scheme. And in this particular location, as you can see on the right hand side, there was competition for various um, uh, uh, road space. Um, there's quite a few businesses in this particular area and the need to provide parking and, and address loading and, and unloading facilities meant that we were quite constrained in this particular area. But I suppose we did some surveys afterwards in, in, in 2018 to see how this, this particular facility uh, 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 per performed. And because of the low frequency of, uh, of pedestrians using the bus stop, it didn't show up as, as, as being particularly challenging at this location. Some other key design features I just want to touch on briefly is um, the entrances and drainage requirements. On the top right hand side here, you'll see um, uh, how, uh, uh, how to deal with entrances. And this is something that comes up very, very frequently on schemes is that the priority for cyclists is uh, somehow, in some way uh, degraded as we approach entrances. So one of the things that we implemented on the TALA scheme um, uh, is we, we looked at um, uh, uh, having continuity at level across entrance. So just in terms of that, what I wanted to mention here is, is, is this is an example of what has been done in the past uh, where we've dropped down the curb and that the vehicle has priority going across there. We've now moved uh, to a different type of, of situation where we have um, a, a, a 50 mil ramp which uh, which cars can, uh, and vehicles can track across. And then we have a, a, a splayed arrangement built into this particular curb on this side to allow vehicles to cross across uh, into access and driveways. Very briefly in terms of drainage, um, one of the things that we find challenging on these schemes all the time is how to deal with levels and particularly levels access, accessing into existing driveways and to avoid insofar as possible uh, the need for accommodation works on private properties. So this particular image on the left, the, the, the left most corner uh, shows a three-tiered three system where we have linear road curb drainage systems. We have a positive drainage by means of gullies, of cycle-friendly gullies on the cycle track. And then we have a dished curb arrangement between the property owner and the public space. Um, as I said, this is an image of what it looks like, like today with our linear drainage, drainage system curb, and then we have our priority so that the, it's, it's a flush system for cyclists moving across these entrances, and the general the vehicles have to track and track up the various level grades into to access the properties. Um, just something, a few basic things in terms of um, uh, urban junctions, and, and it's not, I'm not going to go into this in, in huge detail, but what to look out for in terms of uh, urban junctions. We try in so far as possible to avoid these left, left slips because establishing the cyclist to turn right, and this is uh, in Black Rock, um, trying, to, uh, trying to establish a position for cyclists to turn right, it's very difficult with uh, vehicles tracking across them. Um, and because of the nature of these particular things, uh, the driver's head is often, um, uh, has to hook around to, to um, witness cyclists coming on the, on the main line, but also then in terms of cyclists wishing to turn, turn, turn right across. This is the example from um, the TALA scheme at Castle Time and Junction. And again, it's a it's a very good example of how to re-establish cyclists on the approach to signalized junctions. Uh, the bus lane in this particular instance terminates, and we have a physical curb along here, which allows the cyclists to, to establish themselves or herself on approach to this particular junction. Um, that is something that we see regularly presented to us as designs that uh, which which don't necessarily comply with the cycle manual. And then we get scenarios presented to us whereby the level of service is uh, particularly poor, where this cycle track ends and the cyclist is bumped out into general traffic. And that's not delivering for uh, the, the 8 to 80. Uh, 
last few slides, um, just some other key features along the scheme in terms of um, the measures which are appropriate for um, uh, right turning cyclists on the approach to signalized junctions and also to particular trip attractor desire points. Um, we have a box, I'll just click onto this. These are box and jug turns. So here in Tala, we implemented a jug turn. In this particular instance, there's two lanes on approach and it was um, because of the AEDT on this particular carriageway, it was more appropriate to provide for cyclists on their own independent phase to cross safely to access Castle Town Road. And again, here, this is at the Green Hills Road in, uh, in Tala, whereby the cyclists go left to go right. So as they want to turn down towards the Tala bypass, you travel along the main line, you splay off to the left-hand side, you stack and wait there until the signal change changes, and then you proceed straight ahead with general traffic. Um, we did a user satisfaction, last two slides, uh, we did a user satisfaction in 2018. My colleague Fanolo Driscoll was, 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 uh, was very um, involved in this. And some of the key stats coming out of that user satisfaction with this particular scheme was that pedestrians were up 158%. We had 25% increase in cyclists on the roundabout and that 117% increase on cyclists on the main line. Generally speaking, we got 93% satisfaction on the scheme, and we had uh, the split of that was 68% male and 32% female. Final slide. Um, top tips in terms of cycle design, understanding and applying the five principles of sustainable safety, as Michael has quite, re quite rightly identified, use those as your, your, your key go-tos uh, when, when you're considering schemes. In terms of the schemes themselves, they're more often than not multimodal corridors with competing transport objectives. We tend to lose our waste sometimes in terms of competing demands as schemes develop. So what I would stress, I would stress here is, is that define the project objectives and constraints from the outset and continually check back about against those uh, as, as, as schemes develop through the, the, through the design. It's rarely, a, rarely come across just an independent cycling scheme. It's often an urban realm, utilities, bridge. There's often other uh, aspects to it. And understanding the traffic regime is absolutely cr critical in deciding between integration and segregation. Um, there's a section in the cycle manual on, on integration and segregation. I would highly recommend that you, uh, that, 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 that the participants read that. And finally, then the golden rule, if it looks wrong, I would suggest come and talk to us. We're here to help local authorities and other designers to, to achieve the right thing. And you'll get a good understanding of what we will fund in terms of, uh, in terms of schemes. And there I will leave it and pop it back to you, Roy.